Understanding Translation, the Terrestrial Order, and the 144,000. Joseph Smith, Genesis 1432. And men, having this faith, coming up unto this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. Near the end of July, this July 2020, I realized that there had been an increase of questions and discussion on this very subject in the social media groups I'm in. Just as it had become more and more difficult to describe all the end times puzzle pieces individually, I noticed that there was just too much information on translation, the terrestrial order, and the 144,000 to be able to explain it concisely in a sentence or two. I have been checking in with the Lord to see if there was more he wanted me to put together in the way of a podcast or video and was totally fine if there was nothing further I needed to do. I certainly wouldn't want to share without his blessing and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to aid me in any pursuit, which includes sharing his word. What would be the point of that? I had actually just packaged up my microphone and put it away. And then on the morning of July 26th, I felt prompted to gather everything I had on the subject of of this video. I had just finished pulling most of what I had together when someone posted a video by Scott Palmer on the rapture and how it relates to what we believe about translation. He had just done this video the same morning. Then after reviewing what I had gathered, I felt prompted that it was time to make a video about it. I had just finished putting the PowerPoint together and was getting ready to do the recording when my hubby informed me that Abraham Gileadi announced that he is also doing a seminar on the subject at the end of the month of August. One thing that has been repeatedly evident in my journey of the past six plus years and which never ceases to amaze me is the synchronicity involved. Over and over again, I have witnessed groups of people questioning, discovering, seeking, and finding answers to the same common doctrine of the gospel, the same subject. It is literally like the Spirit is teaching many people to study the same thing at the same time. And the timing of this subject I find very telling, as I believe we may soon be watching it come to fruition. My name is Jody Stoddard, and these are insights from a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. These are my own opinions and are in no way a representation of the church. While 95% of what I use in this presentation are scriptures and quotes from ancient and modern prophets and apostles, this is my interpretation of information I have found on the subject. I encourage you to pray and study and seek a confirmation from the Spirit and Holy Ghost. I have been overwhelmed with the response from the first video series on Daniel and Revelation. I sincerely have no desire for fame or recognition, but I do get passionate about sharing the gospel. And despite the fact that I am actually somewhat of an introvert, the Holy Ghost on occasion pushes me out of my comfort zone and I get excited to share. I pray that I never come across as arrogant or condescending. Truly, my only desire is to point people to Christ. One thing I do know is that the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. For every question I have answered, several more take its place. I guess that's one reason why we need eternity. Rapture versus Translation as I mentioned earlier, Scott Palmer did an excellent video on the difference between what our Christian brothers and sisters call the rapture and the forms of it we believe. And I've posted a link for that at the end. The term rapture is not found in the scriptures. However, that's just semantics. And our Christian brothers and sisters do tend to believe in it slightly different than, than we do. Rapture is from Latin, which translates the Greek rapimur meaning we are caught up or we are taken away. So yes, technically, we do believe in both a mid-tribulation and an in-tribulation rapture, which we call translation. What is translation? Joseph Smith said, now the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to this priesthood. There are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and prudent, 
to be revealed in the last times. From LDS.org, we read, Translation describes persons who are changed so that they do not experience pain or death until their resurrection to immortality. In 3 Nephi 28, verse 7, it speaks of them never tasting of death. And in 3 Nephi 28, 38, it says that they might not taste of death. There was a change wrought upon their bodies. Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 1432 and men having this faith coming up under this order of God were translated and taken up into heaven. What are the attributes of translated beings? As we read through these, think of scriptural figures who have possessed these powers or blessings. Number one, more blessed. Two, no pain, disease, or infirmities. Three, no sorrow, save it be for the sins of the world. Four, cannot be held in prison. Five, immune from fire. Six, immune from Satan's grasp. Seven, power over their own death. Eight, convincing power of Christ. Nine, power over the elements. 10. Power over the law of gravitation. 11. Not bound by the natural laws of the earth. 12. Travel at the speed of thought. 13. Walk on water. 14. Perform miracles. 15. Unharmed by animals. 16. Walk among men unrecognized and even unseen. 17. Raise the dead. 18. Receive a fullness of joy. I am sure there are more, but that gives us a good outline of what the attributes are of translated beings. Who do we know that has experienced translation? In Genesis we read, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In Moses chapter 7, we read that the Holy Ghost fell on many and they were caught up into Zion. In Deuteronomy and Alma, it says, No man knoweth of Moses' sepulchre unto this day. In 2 Kings, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And in D&C 1.10, Elijah was taken to heaven without tasting of death. In John and Doctrine and Covenants, the Savior is speaking to the disciples and he says, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is it to thee? And in D&C 7, John the Beloved will live until the Lord comes. Translated Beings Latter-day Saint scriptures speak of a unique class of beings, persons whom the Lord has translated or changed from a mortal state to one in which they are temporarily not subject to death, and in which they experience neither pain nor sorrow except for the sins of the world. Such beings appear to have much greater power than mortals. All translated beings will eventually experience physical death and resurrection. That was from Mormon doctrine. Translation is a necessary condition in special instances to further the work of the Lord. Translated beings are not resurrected beings though all translated beings either have been since or yet will be resurrected or changed in the twinkling of an eye to a resurrected state. And we can read about that in 3 Nephi 28. In effect, this last change is their death and they therefore receive what amounts to an instantaneous death and resurrection. Resurrection is a step beyond translation and persons translated prior to the resurrection of Christ were resurrected with him. And we can read about that in D&C 133. It is expected that those translated since Christ's resurrection will be resurrected at his second coming. From Enoch to the time of Noah, many faithful saints were translated. Moses 7:27 says, And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and Son, 
and the Holy Ghost fell upon many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. During the period from Adam to Melchizedek, many faithful persons were translated. Enoch and the righteous residents of his city Zion were translated not many years after Adam's death. During the period from Enoch to Noah, it appears that faithful members of the church were translated, for the Holy Ghost fell upon many, and they were caught up into Zion. So did you catch that? It was not a one-time event, but as people qualified, they were taken up. Enoch is reserved until a day of righteousness. In D&C 38, and also Moses 7, we read, I have taken the Zion of Enoch into mine own bosom. In Doctrine and Covenants 45.12, we read, Who were separated from the earth, and were received unto myself, a city reserved until a day of righteousness shall come, a day which was sought for by all holy men, and they found it not because of wickedness and abomination. So Enoch has been waiting for the millennium, for the time when the earth is cleansed, and they can return. Over and over again, we see patterns repeating. For instance, what was the flood? It was a baptism of the earth. So remember that. It'll be significant later in pointing out another pattern that relates to our day. After the flood, others were also translated. Fewer translations are mentioned in the New Testament era, though John the Beloved and the three Nephites were translated. Is that because it was a plain and precious doctrine that was removed from, our, from the scriptures like the Bible? Or was the faith of the saints lacking so it happened less frequently? Was it just not necessary anymore? Those are all good questions to consider. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. Translated beings are of the terrestrial order. Translated beings are terrestrial beings, but not the same as terrestrial resurrected beings. How do we know that? Let's read about it. Because the gospel was not taken to those outside paradise until the meridian of time, the Lord chose periodically to utilize the services of the ancients elsewhere. Many of the righteous were translated, prolonged in life, raised to a terrestrial level of existence, and given assignments to continue their labors in behalf of the children of men. In speaking of Enoch and his city, the prophet Joseph said, Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into eternal fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order, and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, and who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Note, the scriptures do not define differences between transfiguration and translation, but it appears that transfiguration is more temporary, as in Matthew 17, 1 through 9, and Moses chapter 1, verse 11, occurring primarily to permit one to behold spiritual things not possible in a mortal condition. Translated Terrestrial Beings Understanding translated as also meaning a pre-resurrected form of terrestrial, Parley P. Pratt said, Ordinary human beings are said to have a telestial body. People who are translated are said to have a terrestrial body. And people who are resurrected are said to have a celestial body. I want you to think about that and let that sink in. 
and see if the spirit teaches you anything from that. Let me repeat it. Ordinary human beings are said to have a telestial body. People who are translated are said to have a terrestrial body. And people who are resurrected are said to have a celestial body. Let's stop here for a minute and talk about what translation isn't. Translation is not a get out of the tribulations free card. I have noticed in my discussions with people that some have the notion that translation is a way to sit out the tribulations from a good seat in heaven. And because of that, they feel it's selfish to even consider the idea. I believe there is much more involved than that. So let's continue on and figure out what translation is all about. Translated beings are ministering angels. Moses and Elijah were translated in order to appear with physical bodies hundreds of years later on the Mount of Transfiguration, prior to the resurrection of Christ. Had they been spirits only, they could not have laid hands on the mortal Peter, James, and John. And we read that in D&C 129, 3-8. Also, I want you to think about something. When it comes to the word ministering, who has been talking a lot about ministering? So now we know that the job of translated terrestrial beings is to minister. So let's see how that fits in to these scriptures in D&C 76, especially considering that we just learned that translated beings can minister to other worlds. D&C 76, starting in verse 86. These are they who receive not of his fullness in the eternal world, but of the Holy Spirit through the ministration, minister, the ministration of the terrestrial. And the terrestrial through the ministration or ministering of the celestial and also telestial receive of the administering of angels who are appointed to minister for them or who are appointed to be ministering spirits for them for they shall be heirs of salvation. That should bring to mind the ministering angels that we learn about in the temple. And also, as we look at this, it's pointing out that those who are in the celestial kingdom will be able to minister to those in the terrestrial. And those of the terrestrial will be able to minister to those of the telestial. But because of the glory of those that are in the celestial, they will not be able to minister to those in a telestial sphere. So you can go down one sphere to minister but not two, or your glory is too great. The existence of translated terrestrial beings. This is a quote from Joseph Fielding Smith, and it was included in um, a gospel doctrine manual, student manual, the, the link for which is at the end. He, he said, when Christ comes, the saints who are on the earth will be quickened and caught up to meet him. This does not mean that those who are living in mortality at that time will be changed and pass through the resurrection. For mortals must remain on the earth until after the thousand years are ended. A change nevertheless will come over all who remain on the earth. All who remain on the earth. They will be quickened so that they will not be subject to death until they are old. Men shall die when they are 100 years of age, and the change shall be made suddenly to the immortal state. Graves will not be made during this thousand years, and Satan shall have no power to tempt any man. Children shall grow up as calves of the stall unto righteousness, that is, without sin or the temptations which are so prevalent today. So again, something that's key in that is that all men who remain, all people, women included, who remain on the earth during the millennium, will be quickened or changed to terrestrial translated beings. Remember, President Nelson's suggested reading. His talk to the brethren, ministering with the power and authority of God, and his talk to the sisters, spiritual treasures from October 2019, 
in both of those talks, he referenced and admonished the reading of Doctrine and Covenants, sections 84 and 107. And did you catch the word ministering? I have never heard a prophet use this word as often as he does. Can you see a pattern here? April 2018 conference was filled with talks on ministering as our focus changed from home and visiting teaching to ministering. Will translated terrestrial beings be necessary in the last days? Doctrine and Covenants 107, 18, the power and authority of the higher or Melchizedek priesthood is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church, to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens opened unto them, to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, that includes the city of Enoch, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And have you heard President Nelson say recently that the restoration is not complete? What are we still missing? Translation is something we are still missing. Keys are needed for translation. Translated terrestrial beings have incredible power. Will this type of power be needed in the last days? Joseph Smith translation, Genesis 14, 27. And thus, having been approved of God, he was ordained an high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch. By the way, the 144,000, we also learned our high priests. It being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. In other words, ordained by God. 29. And it, the Melchizedek priesthood, was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many who believed on his name. So, first of all, by his own voice. What is President Nelson been saying? Hear him. Seek to be taught by the Lord himself. And we've also had a huge emphasis on calling the church by the name of Jesus Christ. So again, verse 29, And it, the Melchizedek priesthood, was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. 30. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that everyone, being ordained after this order and calling, should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from the, before the foundation of the world. And men having this faith, coming up into this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. Wow. Is it any wonder that in President Nelson's talk, The Price of Priesthood Power, he says the following, I urgently plead with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself, will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity.
Doctrine and Covenants 7711. What are we to understand by the sealing of the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? Answer. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. Revelation 14.3 And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Is Alma speaking of the same song in chapter 5, verse 26? And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? I can testify that there is a song. I do not know the words, I cannot remember the melody, but I know that there is a song, and I have felt to sing it. I'm just waiting to be able to remember it. Who are the 144,000? Will they all be men, high priests only, or will they be husbands and wives on a special mission? Will they be home at night? What if they have young children? Will they go back and forth between heaven and earth? From what we know about Enoch, entire families were translated, but will the 144,000 be a more specialized group? different from the mainstream translated terrestrial beings? I don't know for sure. I have some ideas based on clues from the scriptures, but I don't know the answers to those questions. But let's see what Revelation 12 has to say. Revelation chapter 12 appears to represent three groups of people. We know that it represents multiple points in time, the pre-existence, the birth of Jesus Christ, and now the end times. It begins by speaking of the woman, which we know from modern revelation is the church, who gives birth to the man-child, which LDS.org says is the kingdom of God on the earth. That kingdom is the millennial kingdom, the new Jerusalem, the 144,000 translated terrestrial beings, everything having to do with the next phase that we're moving into. Verse 5 says that this child or group preparing the kingdom was caught up into God and to his throne. So that is a translation reference. I believe this is the first group, likely the 144,000 that John spoke of back in Revelation 7. Then the woman or church or a portion of is given wings. Wings can refer to becoming translated beings where she is removed from harm for three and a half years, likely the worst of the tribulations. Think about the five wise virgins here. Think about Christ taking the bride or portion of the church to the wedding feast and closing the doors. Can you see how this could also be related to them being translated? Translated terrestrial beings are beyond the grasp of Satan. They're out of his reach. Then in verse 17, he gets angry and goes after the remnant of her seed or those who were not prepared. So here you want to think of the five unwise virgins and they must suffer through the wrath that is poured out without mixture upon the earth. So to recap, we have the first group in Revelation 12, which appears to be the 144,000. Then we have the second group, which is part of the church that is prepared. And then the third group, which is a part of the church that Satan goes after, referred to as the remnant, 
of the seed of the woman and he goes after them and um, they are not prepared. So often in the scriptures, there's a reference to the Savior showing himself or coming back or returning. What we often forget is that he comes back at least seven times prior to his official second coming, where he burns the earth and everything's sanctified and then the millennium starts. So as you read Doctrine and Covenants 45 here, I want you to realize this is not that final time. This happens in the middle, and you can tell from the scriptures themselves. It's D&C 45, 44. And then they shall look for me, and behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great, great glory, with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off. And here we go. But before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump, and the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. The saints shall come forth from the four quarters of the earth. So we have a partial resurrection there that are going to meet him in the cloud. And the saints from the four quarters of the earth shall come and meet him in the cloud. Verse 47, then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations, and then shall the Lord set his foot upon the mount, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. So here we see that a group of people who are prepared, both those that are ready to be resurrected, and those saints from the earth who are ready, will be taken up in the clouds prior to his coming down. And then after they're taken up and gotten out of the way, then the destruction of the Lord falls upon the nations. And then sometime after that is when he will set his foot upon the Mount of Olives and it shall cleave in twain. So again, there's a series of events happening here. It doesn't all happen all at once. There's time in between each of these events, but there's a group that is taken up they begin their mission prior to the official second coming and prior to his arm falling upon the nations, also known as the Great Tribulations. All right, are there more clues about a mid-tribulation translation in the scriptures? Let's look at Doctrine and Covenants 88, starting in verse 95. And there shall be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. There's a lot of people who read that and think, oh, well, that's the second coming. But remember, we have more than one time when the Lord's face shall be revealed, when he will be here. And if you go on, you can tell this is not the final time because it says in 96, and the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened, that's translated, and caught up to meet him. They are Christ's, the first fruits, who shall descend with him first. We can't descend with him if we haven't first ascended and been taken up. And they who are on the earth and in their graves who are, the, who are first caught up to meet him, and all this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of God. So again, the, generally the same story is playing out here again in these scriptures. The saints that are upon the earth shall be quickened or translated and caught up to meet him, and later shall descend again with him. When the city of Enoch was raptured or taken up, that was not just a one-time event. Translated terrestrial ministering angels from the city continue to come down, minister, teach, and gather them, taking them up as well. They became known as part of the church of the firstborn, and all of this was prior to the destruction of the wicked by the flood. Gather, that's another key word, something that we're hearing a lot of lately, gathering. 
This is a type in our day, whereas those in Enoch's day were rescued prior to the baptism of the earth by the flood, people in our day will be rescued from destruction prior to the earth's baptism of fire. Are they we? Moses 7:63, And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there, and we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. President John Taylor said, When the time comes that these calamities we read of shall overtake the earth, those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former days, and the city will be translated. And Zion that is on earth will rise, and the Zion above will descend, as we are told, and we will meet and fall on each other's necks and embrace and kiss each other. And thus the purpose of God, to a certain extent, will then be fulfilled. And that's from the Journal of Discourses. Elder McConkie said, Though the day of the second coming is fixed, the day for the re redemption of Zion depends on us. After we as a people live the law of the celestial kingdom, after we gain the needed experience and learn our duties, after we become by faith and obedience as were our fellow saints in the days of Enoch, after we are worthy to be translated, if the purposes of the Lord should call for such a course in this day, then Zion will be redeemed and not before. There's that word redeemed again. It was used back when we were talking about singing the song of redeeming love. I think that's another key word we need to pay attention to. Wilford Woodruff said, But before Christ comes, a people have got to be prepared by being sanctified by the Lord. Temples have got to be built. Zion has got to be built up. There must be a place of safety for the people of God while his judgments are abroad on the earth. There's a lot going on in those three sentences. First of all, a place of safety for God's people. And then again, he talks about being sanctified. And in that quote before by Elder McConkie, he used the word, a people living the law, the celestial law, or the law of the celestial kingdom. You know what those are. If you've been to the temple, you know what the laws of the celestial kingdom are. We know what the laws of the terrestrial kingdom are. So are we living those laws? It doesn't say we have to be perfect. We won't be perfect, but we can become sanctified as we live the laws that we've learned in the temple and seek to be sanctified. And President Woodruff also said in here, temples have got to be built. And boy, we're seeing that come to fruition. Eventually there'll be thousands of temples in the earth, but we have seen an incredible amount of temples just since President Hinckley was put in as the prophet. So a lot of this has been fulfilled and it's amazing. And yeah, there's just a lot of stuff going on in those three sentences. So I hope you'll study those out. Hubie Nibley said, what is Zion? How long shall God wait for us to sanctify ourselves and become one in the Lord, in our actions and in our ways for the building up of the kingdom of God, that he can bless us? How long, Latter-day Saints, before you will believe the gospel as it is? Believe. Pay attention to that word. The Lord has declared it to be his will that his people will enter into covenant, even as Enoch and his people did, which of necessity must be before we shall have the privilege of building the center stake of Zion. Again, how long until you believe all of this? How long until you believe that we can enter a covenant as Enoch and his people did? We need to believe and have the faith. 
John Taylor said, When that time arrives, Enoch's Zion will descend, and the latter-day Zion will ascend, both possessed of that same spirit, their peoples having been preserved by the power of God to take part in the event of the latter days. Do you feel and believe that you have been preserved by the power of God to take part in the events of these latter days? Elder McConkie said, Raphael, whom we assume to have been Enoch or someone from his dispensation, came and committed such keys as appertained to that day. No doubt, these include the power to use the priesthood to translate men, as will be the state of all those who abide the day of the second coming. Okay, let's go over that again. Raphael, or someone we assume to have been Enoch or someone from his dispensation, came and committed such keys as appertain to that day. No doubt, these include the power to use the priesthood to translate men, as will be the state of all those who abide the day of the second coming. What does abide the day from Malachi, Joel, and Doctrine and Covenants, among other scriptures, mean? The scriptures say the sanctified will abide the day. Is it possible our prophets are trying to tell us to get sanctified so that we can be translated, so that we will physically be capable of abiding the day of the Savior's coming as well as those days leading up to it? Did that make you feel uncomfortable? I know sometimes when I think about this and the miracle that it is and I wonder, am I... Am I imagining things? Is this too good to be true? Is it even doctrine? Well, it is doctrine. Orson Pratt said this, speaking of Enoch's Zion, among other things, they learned the great doctrine and principle of translation, for that is a doctrine, the same as the doctrine of the res resurrection of the dead, which is among the first principles of the plan of salvation. And we may also say that the doctrine of translation, which is intimately connected with that of the resurrection, is also one of the first principles of the doctrines of Christ. So we need to get comfortable with that. We need to believe and have the faith. If it happened to Enoch and an entire city, and if we are trying to prepare the earth for the Lord's second coming, we need to get comfortable with that doctrine. Marvin J. Ballard said, Although they had the ability to live in the earth among men, they had power over the elements of the earth, power over the law of gravitation, by which they could move over the face of the earth with the speed of their own thoughts, power to reveal themselves to men, and yet power to mingle and move among men unobserved and hidden. Can you see how those gifts might come in handy in the future? Can you see how they might be imperative and necessary? Especially if we're using, and maybe only if we're using them to rescue and minister and save others who are turning back to the Lord. 3 Nephi 28:39. Now this change was not equal to that which shall take place at the last day, but there was a change wrought upon them, insomuch that Satan could have no power over them, that he could not tempt them, and they were sanctified in the flesh, that they were holy, and that the powers of the earth could not hold them. The more you start to see in the scriptures, the more you wonder if some of these references don't also refer to translation. This is Alma chapter 26, partway through verse 5. And they shall be gathered into the garners, that they are not wasted. 
Yea, they shall not be beaten down by the storm at the last day. Yea, neither shall they be harrowed up by the whirlwinds. But when the storm cometh, they shall be gathered together in their place, that the storm cannot penetrate them. Yea, neither shall they be driven with the fierce winds, whithersoever the enemy listeth to carry them. So there we see that Satan isn't going to have any power over us. But behold, they are in the hands of the Lord of the harvest, and they are his, and he will raise them up at the last day. So again, you have a reference to being raised up, being out of the grasp of Satan. Elder McConkie. During the millennium, all men will be translated. As it were, in that day, there shall be no sorrow, because there is no death. In that day an infant shall not die until he is old, changed in the twinkling of an eye, and shall be caught up, and his rest shall be glorious. The last part of that was Doctrine and Covenants 101.29. Elder McConkie also said this, Millennial man will live in a state akin to translation. His body will be changed so that it is no longer subject to disease or death as we know it, although he will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to full immortality when he is a hundred years of age. He will, however, have children, and mortal life of a millennial kind will continue. So, oftentimes people ask, are we having children in the millennium? If we're translated, can we have children? The answer is yes. Translated beings can have children. Children will continue to be born through the millennium. Joseph F. Smith said the following, But when shall I be prepared to go to the New Jerusalem or Zion? Not while I am possessed of that selfishness and greed, that would induce me to cling to the world or my possessions in it at the sacrifice of principle or truth. But when I am ready to say, Father, all that I have, myself included, is thine. My time, my substance, everything that I possess is on the altar to be used freely, agreeable to thy holy will, and not mine, but thine be done. Then, perhaps, I will be prepared to go and help redeem Zion. Sometimes I think we're waiting to be asked to live the law of consecration. We've already been asked to do that. Are we doing that? President Smith here knew that that was required of him. And it's really as simple as this. When you give everything to the Lord, everything, your time, everything, then he gives it back to you to be stewards over it. And it is the most wonderful, freeing, peaceful feeling. You're no longer caught up in the world. You're no longer worried. If your car stops running, you can just turn to the Lord and you say, Lord, your car stopped running. And I know that thou knowest that I need to get to work so that I can provide food for my family. So how would you like me to take care of repairing your car, Lord? And when you're able to let go, the miracles happen, the answers come. When we're hanging on to everything and trying to control everything and fix it ourselves and make it happen, then we're struggling. We're not doing it his way. But if we give everything to him, and wake up every morning and say, tell me what you want me to do today, Lord. Tell me how you want me to spend your money. Tell me how you want me to spend my time. Then the heavens open and it is amazing. And that is what is required of us. That is one of the celestial laws we need to be living. And we need to stop waiting to be asked to do it because we've already been asked to do that. I wonder how widely known translation actually was in past history, because even in ether, he seemed to realize translation might be an option. In 
chapter 15, verse 34. Now the last words which are written by Ether are these. Whether the Lord will that I be translated, or that I suffer the will of the Lord in the flesh, it mattereth not, if it so be that I am saved in the kingdom of God. So was it more of a common occurrence back then than it is now? Or is it a common occurrence now and we're just not aware of it? And again, too, I love the fact that it didn't matter. And we need to have that mindset as well. If we're translated and we can serve the Lord that way, awesome. If he needs us on the other side of the veil to serve him, awesome. If we have things that we need to learn by going through part of the tribulations, awesome. It's a win-win. No, no matter where we end up, it's going to be a win. As long as we keep focused on the Lord and his will. Joseph Fielding Smith said the following, When our Savior comes, the earth will be changed to a terrestrial condition and will then be made the fit abode for terrestrial beings. And this condition will last until after the close of the millennium, when the earth will die and be raised again in a resurrection to receive its glory as a celestial body, which is its final state. We are living in the great day of the restoration. The Lord has declared that all things are to be restored to their primitive condition. Our 10th article of faith says, We believe that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. Too many have the idea that this has reference to the celestialized earth, but this is not the case. It refers to the restored earth as it will be when Christ comes to reign. This is taught in Isaiah and in the Doctrine and Covenants. So who will get to stay here for the millennium? Those who abide a terrestrial law. Those who are only abiding a telestial law will be swept off, but those abiding a terrestrial or a celestial law will be allowed to stay. Neil Maxwell said this, We understand, of course, that there will be many non-members of the church living during the millennium, but there will be a clear willingness by all the good and decent men and women of all the races, creeds, and cultures to abide by a terrestrial law. The church te seems to teach us through themes and they run that theme over and over again. For instance, uh, four or five years ago, the theme was keeping the Sabbath day holy. And that's what a huge focus was on. Um, then it was the year after that, the theme, at least that I continued to hear was ask. Ask, 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 seek and ask over and over again. So I want you to think about that as we go through the story of the three Nephites. The chapter heading, the chapter headings have a lot of information. Uh, third Nephi, chapter 28, says nine of the 12 disciples desire and are promised an inheritance in Christ's kingdom when they die. The three Nephites desire and are given power over death so as to remain on the earth until Jesus comes again. They are translated and see things not lawful to utter, and they are now ministering among men. So if you want to get out your scriptures and follow along in 3 Nephi 28, And it came to pass, when Jesus had said these words, he spake unto his disciples, one by one, saying unto them, What is it that ye desire of me after I am gone to the Father? <clears throat> Interesting note here. I have talked to people before who have um, been missionaries and they were sent to pick up an apostle for his own conference or something from the airport. And over and over and over again, it's just been so interesting to me because they all say the same thing. The apostle gets in the car with them and then he looks at all of them and he says, what do you want to know? What do you want to ask me? So that's how the Savior is. He's waiting for us to ask. Verse 2, and they all spake, save it were three, saying, We desire 
we're asking that after we have lived unto the age of man that our ministry wherein thou hast called us may have an end and that we may speedily come to thee in thy kingdom and they're talking to christ and he said unto them blessed are ye because ye desire this thing of me therefore after that ye are seventy and two years old ye shall come unto me in my kingdom and with me ye shall find rest okay what kingdom is christ talking about he's talking about the millennial kingdom he's talking about the kingdom that we are building right now that is the kingdom that christ will oversee verse 4 and when he had spoken unto them he turned himself unto the three and said unto them what will ye that i should do unto you when i am gone to the father and they sorrowed in their hearts for they durst not speak unto him the thing which they desired and he said unto them behold i know your thoughts and ye have desired the thing which john my beloved who was with me in my ministry before that I was lifted up by the Jews desired of me. And then listen to this, verse 7. Therefore, more blessed are ye, for ye shall never taste of death, but ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men, even until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father, when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven and ye shall never endure the pains of death but when i shall come in my glory ye shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality and then ye shall be blessed in the kingdom of my father so to the nine back up in verse three he said blessed are ye when you die at 72, ye shall come unto me in my kingdom. And in verse 8, he says, more blessed are ye. Verse 7, more blessed are ye. And then in verse 8, because when you die, you shall be blessed in the kingdom of my father. So there's a difference there in what they're getting. And I want you to think about the progression that we go through in the temple. We have to go through the telestial room to get we, we're in the telestial room then we go to the terrestrial room we have to go through the terrestrial room to get to the celestial room so just keep that in mind in verse 9 and again you shall not have pain while you shall dwell in the flesh neither sorrow save it be for the sins of the world and all this will i do because of the things which ye have desired or asked of me for ye have desired that ye might bring the souls of men unto me while the world shall stand so their desire is righteous and it is granted verse 10 and for this cause ye shall have a fullness of joy and ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my father yea your joy shall be full 12 and when it came to pass that when jesus had spoken these words he touched every one of them with his fingers, save it were the three who were to tarry, and then he departed. And behold, the heavens were opened, and they, the three, were caught up into heaven and saw and heard unspeakable things. So they, those three were taken up. They were shown the beginning from the end so that they would have the faith to know how to act on the earth to be able to save the souls of men when you know and you no longer have to worry and the veil isn't there anymore then you can act in perfect accordance with the will of the lord verse 14 and it was forbidden them that they should utter neither was it given unto them power that they could utter the things which they saw and heard isn't that interesting because more and more as I learn, it becomes more and more, the more I learn, the more difficult it becomes sometimes to share that. So I can understand when Nephi and the other prophets have spoken and said, I, I don't even know how to explain this to you. And they, they struggled with their words because our language here is so weak and we're trying to impart a perfect message 
they are through the scriptures trying to impart a perfect message and and it's hard because of our limited language but they were also forbidden that they should not utter neither was it given them power that they could utter the things which they saw and heard 16 but it came to pass that they did again minister upon the face of the earth so they were taken up they were trained and shown things and then they came back down to the earth to minister nevertheless they did not minister of the things which they had heard and seen because of the commandment which was given them in heaven so there's again a lot going on there and that's it's an amazing account there's a lot to learn in that chapter third nephi chapter 28 and so i hope that you will spend more time prayerfully studying that chapter and see what the spirit can teach you is asking requisite john asked the three nephites asked i don't know perhaps start by asking what lack i yet and go from there remember all those who remain on the earth for the millennium will between now and then be translated into terrestrial beings so probably the bigger question is to find out what your mission is and if and when translation will be part of that mission or do we just need to believe do we just need more faith president john taylor said when the time comes that these calamities we read of shall overtake the earth those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former times moroni 733 and christ hath said if ye will have faith in me ye shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me 37 it is by faith that miracles are wrought and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men wherefore if these things have ceased woe be unto the children of men for it is because of unbelief like nephi neither am i mighty in writing like unto speaking for when a man speaketh by the power of the holy ghost the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. So if you have felt or learned anything, it is not from me, but from the Lord through the Holy Ghost. I look forward to what others are learning and will be grateful to add the truths they have found to my own understanding that we may all be edified together is my prayer. In Jesus' name, hurrah for Israel.